Welcome to Parasitic Diseases. Today we're going to discuss loiasis, an infection caused by a filarial worm known as Loa Loa. Loa Loa has a very narrow geographic distribution as shown here. It's an infection found both in West Africa and in Central Africa and in, along the equator. That's basically where this infection and its consequences are found. And the history of discovery involves several groups of people. Uh, it was Mackenzie who first identified the microfilaria, but Robertson identified the adult worm. Robertson actually had a housekeeper from a region of West Africa known as uh, Calabar. And in fact, Old Calabar was a, a region near the Cote d'Avra, and uh, she migrated to Scotland and worked for Robertson. And one day, Robertson was talking to her, as the anecdote goes, and noticed that in both eyes, there was a swelling, which was serpiginous, which he surmised was a worm. And he said, do you know, <laughs> I'm sure he must have said this, uh, do you know you have a worm in your eye? And she says, everybody where I'm from has worms in their eye. He says, it's very common. He says, well, um, I think we should remove them. And of course, she agreed. And the remarkable um, consequence is that he removed two worms. One was the male, and the other was the female worm. So Robertson is given credit for describing both the male and the female worm, Loa Loa. And Mackenzie is given credit for discovering the fact that these are filarial parasites that produce offspring, which you can find in the blood. A Brit by the name of Leiper, a very famous uh, parasitologist of his day, um, described the vector portion of the life cycle, and it involves deer flies known as chrysops. That's the genus of deer flies, and they're found throughout the world, but only the ones in West and Central Africa are capable of transmitting this infection to people. So let's look at the life cycle. This life cycle is very similar to Wichereria and Oncocerca. The chrysops fly, or the deer fly, bites, and uh, we all know what it feels like to be bitten by a, a deer fly if we spend any time in the woods whatsoever. They have large cutting plates that they scissor their way through the, the flesh, create a pool of blood, they then fly off and use that blood for their food as well as for egg production. When they do so, and if they happen to be an infected chrysops species, then the larvae, as with all the other filarial parasites, are deposited on the skin. And when the chrysops then removes its mouth parts after feeding and flies off, the worms then migrate into that site. Now here's another twist on a filarial parasite infection. <clears throat> the adult Wichereria seeks out a lymphatic vessel. The adult Oncocerca remains put in the subcutaneous tissues where it obviously grew up from a larva that, that entered that bite wound. The adult of Loa Loa, or the larva of Loa Loa, doesn't stay put, but remains in the subcutaneous tissue. So as it undergoes its development from a third stage larva, which is what it was when it entered the bite wound, to an adult, all of that biology occurs within the subcutaneous tissues. The adult worm never leaves the subcutaneous tissues. And it, of course, ingests host material, processes it, produces microfilaria, which then, by the way, find their way into the blood, because if that didn't happen, then, of course, another chrysops couldn't come along and pick up the infection. So somehow the microfilaria has to work its way from the adult female in the subcutaneous tissue to the blood supply. And it does so by brute force, basically, the way almost all other nematodes behave, by brute force. The adult worm continues its migratory path. It doesn't have any particular place in general that it locates to, and it continues to move. Now, as it processes material from the host, it, of course, has metabolic wastes that it needs to get rid of. And in doing so, Eventually, it sensitizes the host to the presence of those secretions. Now, they could be secretions that it uses to dissolve host material, like enzymes, or it could be 
uh, large molecular weight waste products that it sheds as the result of its renewal of its own tissues or the production of microflurry. We're not sure of what these are, but we do know the consequence, of course. And that is, wherever the adult worm is found on the tissue, the swelling as a response to those secretions occurs behind wherever the worm is. If it should happen that the swelling occurs on a long limb that is noticeable, there's a, an old term for it, an old term, which I didn't mean to use the word old because it's actually known as old calabar swelling. It's, it's so well known that this occurs in a region of Africa that was formerly known as calabar that we still use that term today to refer to the pathological consequence of the host responding to the secretions of the adult worm. But to continue the life cycle, once the microfluria are produced, which is about three to five months after the worm achieves adulthood, the larvae are then picked up by a new um, chrysops fly. And like all of the other filarial parasites in the mosquito muscle wing, uh, wing muscles rather, and in the black fly uh, wing muscles, the larvae of, of Loa Loa migrates through the digestive tract of the fly into the muscle tissue, penetrates a muscle fiber, and develops from a first-stage larva to a third-stage larva. When its uh, biology is complete, about two or three weeks afterwards, it then migrates back into the fly's circulation, finds its way to the mouth parts, and waits for that chrysops to take a blood meal. And when that occurs, of course, they become deposited on the skin of the next host, and that completes the life cycle. Aside from this calabar swelling that occurs on the long limbs, which is noticeable, but probably occurs in other places throughout the body too, but less notably, less noticeable, I should say, to a physician, we have the possibility, because the subcutaneous tissue is directly connected to the eye, and we know this from our prior discussion with Ankasurka, we can now see the adult worm of Loa Loa on the sclera of the eye itself. And that's indeed the way that uh, Robertson's uh, uh, housemaid presented to him, which allowed him to discover the presence of the adult of this parasite. Here's a wonderful up close and personal picture of a chrysops. In this case, it's a cutiens uh, found throughout West Africa. And now Dr. Daniel Griffin is gonna give a clinical vignette illustrating the pathogenesis of this infection. It's a case of a woman in her 30s who returns to the U.S. after a two-year period of service in the Peace Corps in Cameroon and Gabon. Now, we don't know much about her time of service in these areas, but of note is that when she returns for her medical exam, they just say these medical exams after people muster out of the Peace Corps, um, they notice that she has eosinophilia. A little bit of a workup is done, not particularly extensive. Uh, they don't come up with a diagnosis and she goes on her way. She then goes to attend a graduate school in New York City, a place where amazing things are happening every day. And again, they notice the eosinophilia. At this point, they think of it as an incidental finding, but she's actually referred for a more extensive evaluation. She reports that she is otherwise asymptomatic. So let's talk a little bit about clinical disease in Loa Loa. Um, a lot of people are asymptomatic. They have no symptoms despite very high levels of circulating microfilaria. The, the one thing that might happen, and I guess you could call this a symptom, right, is that the worms might migrate across the eye and, and they might be noticed when they're doing that. One of the symptoms that we might see though are calabar swellings. And these are a, um, an immune response these are migratory swellings um, that, occur, that occur. Um, and we might also see peripheral eosinophilia, um, more something of a, I guess, a sign rather than a symptom. This is what gives uh, Loa Loa its um, name, the African eye worm. And here you can see uh, what a person might uh, be a little upset about, uh, looking in the mirror perchance and seeing that there's a worm migrating across the eyeball. See it in the subcutaneous tissue of the eye in this photo. Uh, this is actually successful removal where actually a small incision has been made and this um, adult Loa Loa is actually being removed here. 
Now, what about calabar swellings? As I mentioned, this is due to the host's immunological um, reaction, and it's actually their secretions um, from the adult worm as it's migrating through the tissue. And certain people, and actually these are often people who did not grow up in an area and did not develop an immune tolerance, um, they will develop these swellings in areas where the, um, where the adult has migrated through. Now let's talk a little bit about diagnosis. Blood smear, very common approach we use in a lot of parasitology. And um, you can actually do a thin blood smear and you stain it with Gimso or Wright solution. Um, but there's a timing issue. Um, this isn't middle of the night, this is middle of the day. So it's important to draw the blood for this test during the middle of the day. Um, and then often people use a concentration technique. Um, it's actually gotten to be, I think, so well known, people refer to any blood smear showing loa loa as a knots test. But the knots test really is a particular type of concentration technique using formulin. Um, but a lot of times in the United States, we'll actually use a nucleopore filtration method, which is not technically a knots test, I would say. Um, but anyway, you're concentrating the blood smear, you're looking for the microfilaria. Um, another test, and this is really something for visitors to an endemic area, would be serology. Let's say a person has low levels of um, circulating microfilaria, where you might not be able to catch this uh, so easily on a blood smear, you can actually look at serological testing. Um, there's also been a nucleic acid amplification test um, with the appropriate or expected sensitivity. Um, so this is a PCR that was developed. Um, actually, it's been adapted to an isothermal amplification test, so this can actually be used as a point of care test now for the diagnosis. What about treatment? Now, treatment gets a little complicated here, so this is a busy slide, so I don't want people to look at the slide. Let's just talk a little bit, and you'll have this slide for reference. You're actually going to look at the levels of circ circulating microfilaria and make your treatment decision based upon that. Um, the concern here is if you have very high levels and you immediately treat with DEC, um, you can end up with a pretty significant, um, say, poor response, let's be honest. Um, you really want to be getting these microfilaria levels down. So if initially, and 2,500 microfilaria per ml has been um, sort of an established cutoff, if it's below that level, you can go ahead and treat with DEC. But if it's greater than the um, 2,500, you've got to get it below the 2,500. And you can do this with apheresis. You can do this with several weeks of albendazole. Then you can move on to DEC, where you're going to treat for about 21 days. And this, again, this is going to be a grad graded manner. So you're going to start off with a low dose, and then you're going to increase the dose to full dose by day four. So this is one of those lookup things, I think, the exact doses. But just what I would say it's important to know is you want to know this level, you want to know that there's a cutoff that you want to be below before you expose a person to DEC. Um, unfortunately, in about half the patients, you're going to have to repeat this DEC treatment. What about surgery? The adult worms in the eye can be surgically removed. As I mentioned, albendazole is, is something that um, when you don't have access to DEC is, is an alternative. Ivermectin, not a preferred agent. Um, and if somebody receives ivermectin when they have a high level of microfilaria. So this is going to be an issue um, if you're going to treat someone with, let's say, river blindness, onchocerciasis, and you haven't done your blood smear to assess co-infection with loa loa, this can actually um, end up with significant morbidity in your patients. So this is that importance of not just knowing about your loa loa, but also knowing about your um, other parasites that might be involved. And then chemoprophylaxis, right? We talk about people taking chemoprophylaxis to prevent uh, malaria, but if you're going to be in a really um, endemic area, um, there have been some studies showing that weekly DEC um, can actually prevent lo loiasis among long-term visitors, um, but it isn't something we recommend for someone who's going to be there for just a short period of time. Now, one of the things you may notice an absence of in this slide is what about doxycycline? And one of the unique things about loa loa is loa loa has never been shown to have the Wolbachia symbiont. So doxycycline is gonna have no impact in this context. What about our patient? Now our patient, um, when they went to this graduate school where amazing things are happening, um, the blood was sent for a microscopic exam and even without concentration, uh, microfilaria were seen with a sheath and three terminal nuclei. So the patient was diagnosed with uh, 
loiasis. And and I, I like this quote because I think we've all learned that maybe we should have used um, pharesis or maybe we should have done a little albendazole to get it down. But she actually went ahead and, and was treated with DEC despite pretty high levels here. And the quotation from the treating physician was a colleague and friend of mine. Um, we treated her with DEC and she became hypotensive for about an hour, but eventually things turned out well and she was parasite free. Um, I think you can get away with stuff like this when you have all the support of a um, developed um, advanced medical system where you can respond very easily to the hypotension. But in a place with limited resources, you want to be a bit more careful in uh, starting your DEC with a high microfilaria count. Controlling this infection involves trying to control the Chrysops vector, which is very difficult. This is a, a water breeding uh, dipteran. It's uh, an aquatic insect, is what I should have said. Its, it's eggs are laid uh, in the water. The larvae hatch and develop through an aquatic cycle, eventually to end up as a pupa and then emerge to fly off and, and live its life as an adult. There's no vaccines for Loa Loa. Nor, nor should there be. I don't think it's a very um, common infection, uh, n probably not rising to the top of a short list of these are the worms that we really need to concentrate our vaccine development programs on. Community-based control programs using albendazole, which is a derivative of albendazole, have been tried to limit the presence or absence of the adult worms in the tissues with limited success. It's unfortunate, but this approach simply doesn't work to make Loa Loa go away. Now remember, Loa Loa is a complicating factor with regards to the treatment strategy for Wuchereria bancrofti. So while it doesn't cause much disease in people, it may inhibit certain chemotherapeutic approaches to control another more serious filarial infection in the same area. So there most people living in, in, the, in the endemic tropical areas where transmission is high for malaria, leishmaniasis, and we'll see later on some other parasitic infections also, could easily be infected with Loa Loa, and particularly in West Africa and in Central Africa. And they represent a conundrum as to what to do. How can we community-based treat and still not exacerbate uh, unwanted pathological consequences of these community-based uh, medical approaches uh, because they become very unpopular very fast when you give a drug to a bunch of people and then they all develop side effects. They don't want a second treatment. <clears throat> Often called neglected diseases, is Loa Loa a neglected disease or is it just a disease that, that hasn't received enough attention from the research community to work out another control strategy that might not even involve vaccines or drugs? There's a good article that reviews that literature. We've discussed uh, Loa Loa at least three times on TWIP, uh, and you can access TWIP on microbe.tv slash TWIP. Next time, we're going to discuss guinea worm. Thanks for listening. <laughs>